The skull and crossbones is a prominent symbol in masonry. Here are some Freemasonic aprons. A skull and usually crossbones are also present in what is called the Chamber of Reflection, a room prepared for initiates undergoing the Masonic rite of the first degree in many orders. What few people know is that both Freemasons and pirates inherited the symbol from the same place, the Knights Templar. The true origin of the skull and crossbones is most likely the Chi Ro, an ancient symbol whose meaning is not morbid at all, but more akin to rebirth. The first Templar to fly the skull and crossbones, legend has it, was Roger II of Sicily, who harassed and plundered the coasts of Greece and northern Africa, and for whom the Jolly Roger is named. According to myth, Roger's father, King Roger I, copulated with the corpse of his wife Adelaide, Roger II's dead mother, and returned nine months later to find only a skull and crossbones. The original Templars were Normans, the blood product of Franks and Vikings. The order was formed during the First Crusade, and with special privileges granted by the Pope, they amassed great wealth and power, operated a vast banking network, and built hundreds of churches and castles across Europe and the Middle East. They also maintained a large fleet of ships, and dominated the commerce of much of the world. The Templar Knights had a good run until 1307, when King Philip IV of France, who was deeply in debt to the order, lit on the idea of wiping out his debts by charging the Templars with heresy. And so, with the consent of the Pope, his men began arresting knights. Many were imprisoned and tortured, and some burned at the stake. Most, however, fled, mainly to Portugal and Spain, Scotland, and very likely Switzerland. How interesting that the home of the Bank for International Settlements, the Central Bank of Central Banks, may well have been a refuge of these medieval bankers. Author Ernesto Frere explored what happened to the Templar fleet, which disappeared from the shores of La Rochelle when the hammer of King Philip came down. He concludes, like others, that many Templars took to the sea after their banishment, thereafter adopting a life of piracy. These skull and bones decorate gravestones in a churchyard in Temple Midlothian, an area granted to the Templars by David I of Scotland in the 12th century. Scotland is rich in Templar history, and some believe that the Knights helped Robert the Bruce win independence from England on the field of Bannockburn. So what do you think? Does the flag of Scotland really derive from the cross of St. Andrew, as legend has it? Or maybe from this? Author John J. Robinson explored what became of the Knights Templar in Britain after their banishment. Robinson makes a strong case that the Templars simply went underground and evolved into what would emerge centuries later as Freemasonry. Robinson is not alone in observing many connections between the two orders. Various Masonic rites belied Templar origins, and the Temple of Solomon, which served as the Templars' headquarters in Jerusalem, is a central feature of Freemasonry. Maybe the best clue that Crusader Knights gave rise to Freemasonry is that Andrew Michael Ramsey, a prominent Scottish Freemason during the 18th century, said so in a speech given at a French lodge. There was already a large Templar presence in Portugal and Spain when those fleeing from France arrived. There, the Templar Knights simply adopted different names. In Castile and Aragon, they joined existing orders, such as the Order of Santiago. In Portugal, a new order was formed, the Knights of Christ. The heirs of these repackaged Templar Knights, who were expert mariners, contributed greatly to the dominance of Portugal and Spain during the era of world exploration. Henry the Navigator was in fact a Grand Master of the Knights of Christ, and Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, and Ferdinand Magellan were all associated with these orders and flew the Templar Red Cross on their ships. This age of exploration was Spain's Golden Age, and then King Ferdinand of Aragon and his wife Queen Isabella of Castile did something stupid. They heeded the counsel of reactionary priests and started the Spanish Inquisition. As a result, tens of thousands of Jews fled. In the latter half of the 16th century, profound changes were taking place in England and Holland. Holland, known for religious tolerance, was a Spanish possession when the Inquisition began, but declared independence in 1581 and eventually kicked the Spanish out. Meanwhile, in England, the Anglican Church broke away from Rome under Queen Elizabeth. To wit, the Catholic Church was losing its authority in these countries, and that's where many Jews fleeing from Portugal and Spain went. And there's good reason to believe that at least some of the Templar remnant there went with them. Here's why.
the religious convictions of the heirs and descendants of the Templar Knights, officially a heretic order, would have been suspect in the eyes of the Catholic Church. The Spanish Inquisition was not just an attack against Jews and Muslims. Any deviation from strict Catholic doctrine was grounds for persecution, and rumors of the Templars' Gnostic beliefs and occult practices had led to their banning. The Knights of the Spanish and Portuguese orders had developed a fruitful partnership with Jewish merchants in Spain and Portugal, who not only invested in voyages to the New World, Africa, and the Far East, but also played a role in marketing valuable goods brought back. Queen Isabella, King Ferdinand, and their successors expropriated property from the orders while the Inquisition raged to help pay for military entanglements, notably against the English and the Dutch. Maybe the best indication that the Templar remnant followed their fleeing Jewish partners is that as the Spanish Inquisition dragged on, Portuguese and Spanish dominance on the high seas went into decline, while that of England and Holland surged. This culminated in the establishment of the Dutch and British East India Companies, which both Freemasons and Jewish merchants played significant roles in. This notion of a Templar flight from Spain and Portugal to England and Holland is almost completely undocumented, but seems very likely and, if accurate, is startling, for it allows us to trace a continuous thread of conquering, plunder, commercial domination, and colonization. It begins with Rollo the Viking, who invades and conquers northern France in the 9th century. The Franks make peace with Rollo and his Vikings by granting them Normandy. A century later, Normans invade and conquer southern Italy and Sicily. Then in the 11th century, more Normans invade and conquer England. They are led by William the Conqueror, Rollo the Viking's direct descendant. A generation later, Normans and allies from all over Europe invade and conquer the Holy Land, at least for a time. This is when the Templar Knights are born. The Templars, in turn, dominate the commerce of the Christian world until they are banned and flee. From Portugal and Spain, they begin exploring the world and establishing trade routes, but are chased out by the Catholic Church again, this time fleeing to Northern Europe and England. There, they and the local Templar remnant, who will later come out of the closet as Freemasons, set up the Dutch and British East India Companies with the help of Jewish merchants and begin colonizing the world. The thread doesn't end there either, for several American families got in on the opium and slave trade rackets. Participating in the opium trade, we have, predominantly, the Astor, Cabot, and Russell families. John Jacob Astor we have already met. Remember Henry Cabot Lodge in Teddy Roosevelt's circle of warmongers? His mother was a Cabot. The Russells we have not yet met, but FDR's grandfather, Warren Delano, was manager of operations in China for the Russell family. On the slave trading side, two other Roosevelt patriarchs, Johann and Jacob, owned a slaving ship, the Expedition. The Browns were involved in the slave trade before they moved into banking, as was George Peabody, who ran the Georgetown slave market. If you think I'm stretching it by alluding to a connection between influential Americans like these and the conquering Normans of old, behold the roots of the following families. Peabody, Brown, Roosevelt, Astor, Taylor, Root, Russell, Cabot. Remember, Duke William of Normandy invaded and conquered England in 1066, winning at the Battle of Hastings. According to houseofnames.org. Peabody, Norman. Granted lands by William the Conqueror for distinguished service at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. Brown. Norman. Granted lands by William the Conqueror for distinguished service at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. Roosevelt. Norman. Granted lands by William the Conqueror for distinguished service at the Battle of Hastings. Astor. Norman. Granted lands by William the Conqueror for service at the Battle of Hastings. All of these families, and there are others, descend from a Norman ancestor who received lands in England from William the Conqueror after the Battle of Hastings. What are the chances? You may be wondering about other key players. The Rockefellers came late to the world domination game and are not Norman, nor are the Harrimans. You wouldn't fight a Morgan on the battlefield of Hastings, for they are Welsh. But they have their own pirate in their history, this guy. Henry Morgan the Buccaneer was one of the first governors of Jamaica, which he used as the base for his exploits in the Caribbean. How interesting that the Jamaican flag like that of Scotland, is a saltire cross. But that's not all. Green and gold happen to be the colors of the Morgan family coat of arms. Obviously, Jewish banking families like the Rothschilds, being German, had nothing to do with the invasion of England. There are, however, some surprising connections beneath the surface. This is the Stuart coat of arms. There have been over a dozen kings and queens of Scotland and Britain emanating from the House of Stuart, and plenty of Stuart blood flows in the current house of Windsor. On the right, we have the Hohencrest. 
Frederick Barbarossa of the House of Hohenstaufen was the first of a long string of Germanic holy emperors, and Hohen blood flowed into other royal houses of Europe throughout history, including the British royal family. Now look where the checks on these two family crests originate, the Jewish house of Kohen. I'm not just grasping at straws here. The elements in family coats of arms are not established willy-nilly. The Herald's College, for example, has been tightly regulating coats of arms in England since the 15th century. Kohen is an alteration of Kagan, which meant king or priest in Khazaria. Khazaria was a large kingdom in Asia, which converted to Judaism in the late 8th century, flourished through the 9th, and folded in the 10th. As Khazaria declined, two major groups there, the Magyars and the Kabars, migrated westward into Eastern Europe. Many, if not most, of the Kabars were Jewish. The Magyars, on the other hand, were really Huns, which is where the Hun in Hungary comes from. Historians invariably refer to these groups as Magyars and Kabars, and you'll never hear them talk about a massive Jewish-Hun migration, but that's really what it was. The leaders of the Magyar tribes were the Arpads, a clan which claimed to be directly descended from Attila the Hun, and who ruled Hungary for most of the country's history. Arpad blood also flowed into the royal houses of Britain through George, a Hungarian prince whose father was an Arpad and whose mother was a Russian princess of Viking heritage. George accompanied Margaret, an English princess who had been born in exile in Hungary, back to Britain in the 11th century, where she married King Malcolm III of Scotland. George's descendants are the Drummond clan, who not only married into the Scottish royal family as well, but became one of the wealthiest banking families in Britain. Two Drummonds happened to be the exchequers of the British Treasury during the American Revolutionary War and doled out the money used to pay for Hessian mercenaries rented by England from Hess Castle. This money found its way not into the pockets of the Hessian soldiers, nor their king, Frederick II, but into the pockets of the king's personal banker, Mayor Amschel Rothschild, whose sons then used the funds as seed money to grow the Rothschild banking dynasty. Rothschild is an adopted name, meaning Red Shield. The original name of the family was Bauer. An alternate version of this name is Bayer, and a Bayer or a Bauer was someone from Bavaria. If you take the blue and silver checks of the Kohen crest, and turn them diagonally, you have the flag of Bavaria. The true origin of all these names becomes clear if you check the Scottish branch of the bloodline, Boer. The bow and arrow was the weapon of choice of the Huns, and this bundle of five arrows is an ancient Hun symbol. The Rothschild banking logo displays the same symbol. This topic is far too deep to really address here. Suffice to say that the ruling elite, be they kings, queens, or bankers, Vikings or Huns, Normans or Khazars or Christians or Jews have been colluding, intermarrying, and competing for a thousand years to get control of nations and markets. This is why it is meaningless to speak of a Jewish conspiracy. Organized religion is for us, the masses, not them. They have a different calling, to rule. The word Kabbal actually derives from Kabbalah. The Templar Knights may have tried to pass themselves off as a Catholic order, but what they really embraced was Kabbalah mysticism, an ancient religious sect with occult overtones which predates Judaism. The dualistic nature of Kabbalah is represented in the interlocking triangles of the Megan David, which was used by Freemasons long before it became a symbol of Judaism. These are not Jewish temples, they are Freemasonic temples, and it goes without saying that the Templars and the other Crusader Knights were really the first Zionists, for they wanted the Holy Land, albeit for themselves. The Templars lost the Holy Land to the Muslims not long after they took it, but in the 19th century, two distinct Zionist movements sprang up pursuant to getting it back. One called for a return of the Jewish people to Israel, while the other hinged on a skewed interpretation of biblical texts known as end times prophecy. Some might be surprised to learn that there are far more Christian Zionists in the world than there are Jewish Zionists. One of the first proponents of Christian Zionism and end times doctrine in Britain was, interestingly, a Drummond while one of the movement's first leaders in America was Charles Taze Russell, whose followers went on to found the Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes, this is the same Russell family that made its fortune selling heroin to the Chinese. Samuel Russell, the head of the family opium business, we briefly met. One of the original Templars may well have been a Russell, for one of the nine knights who formed the order was a man known to history as Russell. This is very interesting, because a 